interested. Um, just to say, we were hoping that there might be um, someone from Palestine who would say a bit um, alongside Richard, but the meeting coincides with the beginning um, of Ramadan, and that's the time when I think, to be fair to Palestinians who are living here, I think it's been an incredibly difficult few months having to watch what's happening back home while here. I hope that the solidarity here brings some comfort, but um, obviously we can't understand um, what people are going through. That said, if there are any With that, I'm going to hand over to Richard. Um, he'll speak for a bit, and then we'll say over. So, Richard, what about? Thanks very much. And, uh, I just want to commend all of you been at the forefront of mobilising enormous over the last number of months in solidarity with the people of Palestine and with uh, as all over this island and indeed as tens of hundreds of people um, and despite the absence of what has been going on the nightmare that the people are suffering uh, I'm sure you virtually every Palestinian I know a horror uh, gains from the mobilizations and the protests and the expression of the uh, that happen uh, when they are facing this absolute uh, horror and uh, nightmare. And uh, I mean, there's so many different places you could start uh, this discussion, but I'll start with a discussion that I was listening to on the radio uh, this afternoon as, as I was making my way up here. There was an American uh, general on who uh, is part of this uh, plan to build a marine pier uh, in supposedly to bring down to the in the Gaza who are facing uh, a famine. And uh, first of all, do you just think uh, that we had? Uh, the regime that comes to defeat by the United States of America uh, that has received additional billions every single year spent on weaponry <coughs> uh, they're indicated with the intention to commence the genocidal war that we did uh, in October of last year, uh, and when, courtesy of U.S. military and political support and the weapon, the horrific weapon, have provided a family. Those weapons, and the United States, the necessary. Of course, even uh, together, the pontoons or the bridges or whatever it is, make this project. It's going to take when all you really have to do is, and that'd be a far, a far better thing for you to do. Operation that. And all the um, general could say as well, our Israeli part, uh, but this is what we're doing. And but he immediately should be throwing that question. Uh, your arms, everything would be fine. So. In a nutshell, narrative or that we on the Palestinian people is weeding out uh, this preposterous narrative <coughs> that all of this, even Biden's term, 
you know, how abhorrent is that description of the horrors of the Palestinian people under protection form? This is the reaction, even if it's at the top, it is in the events of October the 7th. That narrative persists, and that we have to challenge, because until we know the truth, and I probably don't need to tell the truth, uh, but I do think it is important the narrative that the horror of it be put back to bed, to my mind, to do it. In one shape or form, we need to do it. If as a result of popular anger, we at some point, this particular effect remains in place, how Israel is to do it in a slightly more response to, in my opinion, uh, the lie that it is, and the truth, and what is my opinion, that the responsibility for the horror lie with its best on the land has been about the Palestinian people. It is not it is not and never has been about providing security for Jewish people. It is always has been a project given by the uh, West Britain, then the United States, way uh, the uh, uh, and now that uh, that's not just the narrative or rhetoric for Palestine for some uh, race uh, project. Let me, uh, because by their own words, do they condemn themselves? Look at the of the Zionist project and all uh, but but notably its own uh, its own architects, they are absolutely clear and all unapologetic from the very a few things to give you thinking of those who established uh, uh, who established the Israeli uh, state. So, Chaim Weizmann, Israel's first president, and this shows you a bit of a dehumanization narrative, if you like, that is central to the justification for the genocidal slaughter that allows them to think it's okay to slaughter 30,000 people and maim and injure hundreds of thousands more and to destroy virtually all their homes. What sort of mentality can justify that? Uh, well, Chaim Weizmann, uh, Israel's first president uh, spells it out in 1937 when he said there is a fundamental difference in quality between Jew and native. Um, and uh, so right from the outset there was a colonial dehumanizing approach to the Arab population. We are of a different quality, we the Jewish people, and by the way this has no, very little to do with religion either, I want to stress, but this is a narrative of Zionism uh, to justify them as a colonial project that has the right uh, to treat the Palestinians the way they went on to subsequently uh, do so. And cr uh, critical to this was the uh, absolute uh, determination of nation or democracy, the very thing that the Western imperial powers so often claim, as I would argue, and I think it's borne out in some of the comments of the earlier uh, Zionist uh, uh, architects of the Zionist project, is the exact opposite from that. Mm -hmm. opposite. The mortal threat, as far as uh, the architects of Zionism and its supporters, is democracy in the Middle East. This is the thing they fear. Mm -hmm. uh, so, at the, uh, at, at the beginning of the British ma mandate in Palestine, a Zionist organization uh, conference in London, uh, one, of the, uh, one of the lead sort of spokespeople of the Zionist movement uh, 
set out their view of this issue. And he says, too commonly, he's talking about democracy, he says, too commonly, democracy means majority rule without regard to diversities of types or stages of civilization or differences of quality. If the crude arithmetical conception of democracy were to be applied now or at some early stage in the future to Palestinian conditions, the majority that would rule would be the Arab majority. So it's very clearly set out. These are lesser people. They're not entitled to the same democracy that we might consider uh, something for, you know, as appropriate to Western people. They're not entitled to it because they are of a lesser quality. Uh, we are, if you like, a superior, uh, we are part of a superior civilization uh, and democracy is simply not something we should give to them. And therefore, ethnic cleansing of Palestinians is absolutely justified. And they're very clear about it. Ben Gurion, 1948, the year the state is established, says, the Arabs of the land have but one function left, to run away. Absolutely clearly, uh, he spells it out. Joseph White, the Jewish National Fund director, uh, um, in 1937 says the transfer of Arab population from the area of the Jewish state does not serve only one aim to diminish the Arab population, it also serves a second, no less important aim, which is to evacuate land presently held and cultivated by the Arabs and thus to release it to the Jewish inhabitants. It's absolutely clear we're going to drive them out and take what is theirs. Uh, Tom Segev, an Israeli jur journalist and historian, said, Quote, disappearing the Arabs lay at the heart of the Zionist dream and was also a necessary condition of its realization. And I could go on. I could go on. But this is simply littered the thinking, uh, the explicit sort of uh, viewpoint of all of the founders of Zionism. We are part of a superior Western civilization. These are a less civilized barbaric people. Therefore, we are perfectly entitled uh, to drive them out and take over their land and their resources and that's what we're going to do and that's exactly what they did. Uh, and in 1948 we see that on a, on a <laughs> catastrophic, to use the Arabic term Nakba, a catastrophic level over a, a course of a year, the most horrendous tactic uh, used by Israeli militia, uh, Zionist militia, to terrorize the Palestinian population out of hundreds of towns and villages. I mean, the sheer horror of it was extraordinary, uh, where <laughs> they would record the screams of those they were killing and murdering, and then replay the recordings of people's screams in surrounding villages to terrorize the rest of the population of getting into trucks uh, and simply fleeing as they did over the course of the year, 750,000 people driven out using uh, terrorist methods. There's no other description for it. So the point I'm making is there is a direct connection between the capacity for the Israeli regime to do what they have done in the last four months to the people of Gaza, as unspeakable, as horrific as it is. Uh, there is a direct connection between that and the ideology which founds the state. It's not some aberration. It's not some reaction to something that ha happened on October the 7th that is somehow maybe justifiable, but a little bit over the top. It is in fact the logical extension of the entire basis of the Zionist project. Right from the beginning, it was about uh, dehumanizing the population in order to kill them and terrorize them to leave the land of Palestine so uh, you could establish this state, which is based on a, a, a concept of racial superiority. Um, it's horrific, but that's, that's, the, uh, that's the logic. And, of course, this project serves certain powerful interests who are its sponsors. Uh, and again, this is not, from their own words, do they condemn themselves. It is not... Uh, it, it it wasn't a throwaway remark when Joe Biden said <coughs> a number of years ago, and repeated it quite recently, when Joe Biden says, if Israel doesn't, didn't exist, we would have to invent it. 
And he goes on to say, to elaborate that point and say, we would, uh, by that I mean we would have to station tens and tens of thousands of US troops across the Middle East. Why would they have to do that? Why would they have to do it? Well, he clearly states it because for them, the Israeli state project is about establishing a colonial outpost for US imperial interests and their desire to control the wider Middle Eastern uh, region. Uh, so they sponsor this Zionist project in order to control uh, the, wider, the wider region. Famously, Britain summed up the same logic as the initial sponsors of the Zionist project uh, when uh, Sir Ronald Storrs, who was the first Governor General of Jerusalem uh, since Pontius Pilate, established by under her Brit, uh, mandate, uh, British Mandate Palestine in 1936, when he was asked about British sponsorship for the Zionist project, and he said, and I'm quoting, uh, our intention is to create a loyal little Jewish Ulster in the Middle East to guard against the potentially hostile sea of Arabism. <coughs> so again, the logic is absolutely, the colonial logic of it is absolutely clear. Our fear is that the Arab people of this region might have self-determination. That has to be prevented at all costs, that the Arab people might actually control the Arab world. So we have to do something to create a division uh, in order for us to subject, subjugate and, uh, and control uh, the area. Uh, and the Israeli state project, the Zionist project, and supporting that project was critical to us. And therefore, far from as you know, Leo Varadkar, for example, repeated, but this is, this again is sort of echoing the narrative you hear again and again. I suggested to him recently in the Dole, uh, I said, would it be so terrible to imagine a Palestine where Jewish people, Muslim people, Christian people, and people of no religion would simply be equal in the land of Palestine? Imagine that. And Varadkar immediately fires back, oh, that's, that's ridiculous. They couldn't possibly live together. They couldn't possibly live together. The implication being uh, there's something, in, there's an inherent conflict between Jewish people and Muslim people and Christian people. So you've got to separate them. You've got to have apartheid. Uh, so that, that is, a, but, a, but the actual historical truth is the opposite. The exact opposite of that. For thousands and thousands of years, Muslim, Jewish people, Christian people, and indeed multiple other religions had lived in what was a sort of cultural and religious melting pot all over the Middle East. All over the Middle East. Uh, but it was the establishment of the, of the Zionist project and the establishment of the Israeli state and the ethnic cleansing of the Palestinians that went with it that drove a wedge uh, between uh, the Arab uh, Muslim population and uh, the Jewish population and created this, uh, this uh, bitter enmity, if you like, that Israel fosters and perpetuates uh, and that the Western powers uh, uh, supported, armed and financed. So, uh, and this is something I think we should all be fairly familiar with. Because, of course, when Ronald Storrs in 1936 references Ireland, what is he referencing? I think it's a, a story we're familiar with. He's referencing the penal laws and the apartheid structures that Britain used in order to try and subjugate Ireland and create divisions between Catholic and Protestant. Uh, deliberately fomenting them as part of an effort to destroy the idea of national self-determination in Ireland uh, and to create and foster, encourage, and perpetuate uh, religious divisions as a way of subjugating the area. So it wasn't a throwaway comment of Ronald Storrs saying it. They were, uh, they were very, very consciously exporting the model of divide and rule that they deployed in Ireland uh, in order to try and do, you know, repeat the same project in terms of the colonial subjugation of, uh, of the Middle East. And indeed, uh, some of the troops that were actually deployed in the revolutionary period, the auxiliaries and so on, and some of the key officers, 
that had been uh, uh, involved in trying to physically and mil militarily crush the Irish revolutionary movement in the 1920s were actually physically sent from Ireland to Palestine. So there's a direct overlap, not just in terms of ideology and thinking uh, the, of colonialism and imperialism, but the actual physical people were sent from Ireland uh, over to uh, over to Palestine to repeat uh, the same uh, to repeat the same uh, uh, project. Um, now, another important aspect of this project, which I, I think it's important to emphasise when we're talking about imperialism, is that if Israel was, uh, if you like, a key uh, pillar of this imperialist project to control the region, it wasn't the only one. Uh, and I think this is very, very important for, uh, for understanding. And something you hear, I'm sure, when you see uh, people being interviewed in Gaza, uh, when you know the over the last four months, you will often see Palestinian people in Gaza when they're asked about their plight and the horror that they're suffering and the world abandoning them. What you hear again and again is, "Where are the Arabs? Where are the Arabs?" You hear it all the time repeated. They're incredibly grateful for the support they're getting uh, in terms of protests all over the world, but they're saying, "Where are the Arabs?" Uh, and it's a very, very good question. Um, because, of course, another key element of the architecture of Western imperial uh, control, or the project to control that region, were also uh, making deals with some of the most reactionary, self-serving forces uh, in, the Arab, uh, in the Arab world. Uh, deliberately carving up the region and handing control over it to some of the most reactionary political forces, particularly uh, in the Gulf states, the Saudi regime, uh, the various emirates, and so on, uh, because they could also be reliable allies in making sure that there was never Arab self-determination uh, in the region. But the fear was that even though they, they worked, you know, literally British civil servants stood in the 1920s in tents in the desert, and drew the map of the Middle East, drew up the lines. Many of the lines are straight because they literally drew them with rulers, uh, British civil servants, but they carved them up in such a way that you would have a sort of balance of power which would ensure no state ever got too powerful and could threaten Western control uh, of the region. That's why you have a lot of these states that don't really have any historical basis. I mean, some of the states obviously do, the larger states, but a lot of them have no real historical basis they're literally hand, handed over to certain tribal familial uh, rulers, but it's all about creating a balance of power to prevent any state ever becoming a serious challenge to Western imperial interests who want to control the region and who know that that region is the source of the most important uh, resource uh, of, if you like, you know, the, of modern times, uh, the discovery of oil that was discovered there at the beginning of the, of the 20th century. So that is... The, the cynical project of carving up the region in a particular way, handing control of much of the region to the most reactionary uh, forces in order to prevent any sort of popular Arab movement of self-determination uh, and freedom that might threaten Western control. But as Sir Ronald Storrs so well put it, there was always a fear that there would be revolution, Th that they couldn't fully rely on these dictatorial regimes that they had installed in power. And of course, they were absolutely right. Because again and again and again, over the, over the decades, there have been revolutions in the Middle East. Again and again and again, massive upheavals uh, in Iraq, uh, in Egypt, uh, where the mass of ordinary people have risen up actually saying, we don't want these Western oil companies or Western powers controlling our resources. We're being impoverished by all of this. We can see how corrupt our own leaders are uh, and threatening to nationalize oil resources uh, uh, and uh, do away with the regimes that are collaborating with the Western interests that, if you like, are keeping down and subjugating the mass uh, of the population. And they're th it's precisely because that fear of revolutionary upheaval taking place, and of course we saw it most recently with the Arab Spring, the massive revolts in Egypt and so on, notwithstanding the brutal counter-revolution against them, again, ably assisted by powers like the United States, 
backing up the forces that want to crush any possible expression of democracy or self-determination by the people of uh, of the uh, of, of the region. <coughs> but if that is their fear, what I want to say is it's also the hope. If the, the, the fear all the time of the big Western powers is that the mass of people of that region uh, are a threat to the West, to uh, Western interests, to the big oil companies and the military industrial complex that wants to control it, their fear is well founded. Uh, and it's a fear that we can draw some hope from in terms of the appalling situation the people of Palestine, uh, the, the, the people of Palestine uh, face. And you just think about it, really. I mean, just imagine if the Saudi regime was overthrown and uh, the access to oil resources of the, of the ordinary Arab people, what, what sort of boycott you could then impose on uh, the Zionist regime. Very, very quickly, if you had uh, revolutionary upheavals in any of these uh, states in the surrounding area, they would have enormous capacity, enormous power uh, to put unbearable, irresistible pressure on uh, the Zionist regime. Uh, and of course, that's why uh, this, these, well, the Abraham Accords were, were uh, being so determinately thought after by the United States of saying, well, what we can do is solve the problem by getting these regimes to normalize their relationship uh, with Israel, when in fact the exact opposite is what we need, is to denormalize relations with Israel. Uh, and we see with the massive, uh, you know, up, uh, huge explosions of popular, particularly in Yemen and elsewhere, but ma uh, Iraq, <coughs> massive mobilizations in solidarity with the people of Palestine, because the vast, vast majority of the Arab street across the region uh, stands instinctively with the Palestinian people. Know their own regimes are corrupt, know their own regimes are collaborating with Israel and the United States uh, and the Western powers, uh, that is actually the force uh, that can deliver the meaningful solidarity uh, that the Palestinian people need uh, to challenge to challenge the Zionist regime, the apartheid regime, uh, the colonial uh, project, and so on. Uh, so, finally, just to, to say about our role in all of that, I mean, if that is, and I certainly believe that is the bigger picture of, of all of this, it's not just some sort of historical inability of Jewish people to live with Muslim people or something practical, it's the opposite, uh, and it is about that imperialist project using the old, the classic old-fashioned tactics of divide and rule in order to subjugate people and steal their resources, uh, we obviously have a huge role in ending the collaboration of Western powers with this project, with this colonial uh, apartheid, uh, apartheid uh, project. Uh, and to put it, and it's why, I mean, sometimes it might seem like political nitpicking to talk about not going over to Washington to uh, shake hands with Biden on St. Patrick's Day. I mean, first of all, the idea that you would shake hands with people who are guilty of arming and supporting and justifying a, a genocide to me is just beyond disgusting. It's beyond revolting. But let's put it in another slightly more positive way. Imagine the impact if they didn't go over. Imagine the impact if they said, it is absolutely unacceptable to us that we could celebrate our national day by standing in the White House and pretending you're some sort of normal politician or that this is some sort of normal circumstance. Imagine the impact that would have globally. It would have an absolutely enormous impact. And when you look at the scale of protest, you know, to go back to the very beginning of the talk, why Biden, who is up to his neck in the blood of every single Palestinian who's been killed over the last four months, and indeed for the decades and decades of apartheid and colonialism and ethnic cleansing that's been visited on the Palestinian people, up to his neck in it, why does he even feel the need to pretend that he cares about Palestinian lives? It's because of the enormous pressure he's under. Because they have exposed themselves. People look at this and think, no, no, this... This is disgusting. 
This is revolting. Nothing can possibly justify this. And they are under serious, serious pressure. Now, at that moment, when they are un under pressure, our job is to pile on that pressure and to say, absolutely, you are up to your neck. <laughs> and they are seriously vulnerable to it. They are seriously vulnerable to it. And I'll just conclude by saying, you know, because it's very easy when you look at the horror that we are witnessing, uh, when you look at the murder, the massacre, uh, the despair, uh, to, to just feel what we're doing doesn't make any difference, it can't make any difference. But I think we need to understand that it can and it does and it is making a difference. Uh, I mean, the first thing that makes a difference is the Palestinian resistance itself. Uh, it is the key thing, but that solidarity which potentially can politically and economically cripple the ability of Israel's sponsors to continue their support for this regime, uh, that, that can make an enormous, enormous difference. And if one doubts that, and I'm not saying it, there's any exact analogies in these things, but if you have any, it's certainly a, a, an important one for us to understand, is what happened in apartheid South Africa. Who were the last two regimes that held out, continuing to want to support that regime when it had been completely discredited across the world? The United States and Britain. Of course, of course. Because it was part of their you know, colonial self-serving uh, interest to have a regime like South Africa based on apartheid uh, uh, in what they would have considered a strategically important area of the world. So of course they held out. But in fact, the actions of workers like the Douglas Doors workers going on strike uh, and then a, a, a growing movement of international solidarity, a boycott, divestment and sanctions uh, brought a regime that a few, you know, a, year, a few years before that regime was brought down, there wouldn't have been many people who would have been predicted it was going to come down as quickly as it did. But all, all of a sudden the House of Cards collapses uh, because of a massive movement uh, of solidarity, making it simply politically impossible for even Britain and the United States to continue to support uh, for, this, uh, for this regime. You could make the same point about Vietnam. At a certain point, a level of popular opposition in the army, uh, which we're seeing also in the United States, of military people saying, and particularly when they've had the bitter experience of the Iraq war before that, of people saying, we don't believe in this anymore. We don't believe in this anymore, and you see the scale of popular protest, their ability to politically uh, continue with this support for this horror is called seriously into question. I'm not saying that guarantees we're going to win out, but I do think that we're at a, a tipping point where they have absolutely exposed what they're up to. And to add it to all of that, I'm sorry, I've gone way too, too, gone too long now, but added on to all of that, the, the juxtaposition of the double standard when it comes to how they re responded to the uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine and how they respond uh, to the horrors that Israel is inflicting on the people of Palestine, people can see it. Immediately see it. Shocking, obscene, blatant double standard. Treating people completely different, purely because uh, in, in each case, the selfish strategic interest is different, therefore we're going to apply a different set of standards. Uh, it, sho it shows their moral and political bankruptcy, but it's also something that has revealed the truth about the nature of these regimes uh, in, in front of millions of people. So our job is to harness that, to put unbearable pressure as part of giving confidence and hope to the Palestinian resistance itself, which will continue no matter what, because it simply has to, but also to millions and millions of people in the Middle East who we've seen in our very recent, in very recent years are capable of revolutionary upheavals against these corrupt regimes, that mobilization against the United States, Britain, European Union's collaboration with Israel can also begin to open up the space for revolutionary upheavals in the Middle East, uh, in the Middle East uh, itself. Um, and I would also say, and this is something we probably should say more, 
but with, with the urgency of what's happening in Palestine, we maybe don't say it enough, is there's a very, very good reason for ordinary people who might be asking the question, why are we putting so much political energy into uh, standing with Palestine when there are so many problems here in Ireland, in Western Europe, and so on? One connection we need to make for people is prior to all this happening, the Irish ruling class and, of course, the British ruling class, even though they, they left the European uh, Union, have been pushing very, very strong for the project of escalating the militarization project in Europe and to returning to us to a dangerous and terrifying Cold War military, possibly even nuclear, competition uh, with Russia and saying we must increase the level of military spending as part of a geopolitical competition uh, with Russia with potentially terrifying consequences. A very simple argument we have to make is that is the last thing we need to do. We do not need more money going into weapons and tanks and missiles in order to escalate geopolitical military uh, competition across the world. One, because it has terrifying possibilities. Two, because look at the people who are heading up the military project that you're suggesting we should get closer to. The people dominating NATO are precisely the people who are supporting the genocide against the Palestinian people. <laughs>